to bear with me here. This is a cold read. The $25,000 Jaw by Richard Connell, published 1922. Rather thirsty this morning, Mr. Addicts, inquired Cowden, the chief purchasing agent. The Mr. was said with a long hissing S and was distinct not to be meant as a title of respect. Cowden, as he spoke, rested his two square hairy hands on Crowley Attic's desk, and this enabled him to lean forward and thrust his well-razored knob of blue-black blue jaw within a few inches of Crowley Attic's face. Too bad, Mr. Attic's, too bad, said Cowden in a high, sharp voice. Do you realize, Mr. Attic's, that every time you go up to the water cooler, you waste 15 seconds of the firm's time? I might use a stronger word than waste, but I'll spare your delicate feelings. Do you think you can control your thirst until you take your lunch at the Waldorf Astoria? Oh, hotel there. Or shall I have your desk piped with ice water, Mr. Addix? Crowley Addix drew his convex face as far away as he could from the concave features of the chief purchasing agent and muttered, Had kippered herring for breakfast. A couple of stenographers tittered. Crowley's ears reddened, and his hands played nervously with his blue and white polka dot necktie. Cowden eyed him for a contemptuous, ooh, for a contemptuous half second, then rotated on his rubber heel, and prowled back to his big desk in the corner of the room. Crowley attic, attics, inwardly full of red revolution, outwardly merely flustered and intimidated, rustled among the piles of invoices and forms on his desk and tried desperately to concentrate on his task as assistant to the assistant purchasing agent of the Pyrian Piano Company. Oh, I'm sure they get a lot of business in a piano company. A vast, far-flung enterprise that boasted with only slight exaggeration. We bring melody to a million homes. He hated Cowden at all times, and particularly when he called him Mr. Addicts. That Mr. hurt worse than a slap on a sunburned shoulder. What made the hate almost beyond bearing was the realization on Crowley's part that it was important, impotent. Gosh, murmured a blonde stenographer from the corner of her mouth. Or gosh. After the manner of convicts. Old Grizzly's picking on the chinless wonder again. I don't see how Crowley stands it. I wouldn't if I were was him. Uh, what do you expect of chinless? returned the brunette stenographer disdainfully as she crackled paper to conceal her breach of the office rules against conversation. Feller with ingrown jaw. Jaws was made to pick on. Okay, so we're making fun. <laughs> okay, I get it now. Oh, sorry, I wasn't... He's got a, he does not have the giga Chad Chen, so that's a, holding him back here. At noon, Crowley went out, out to his lunch. Not to the big hotel, as Cowden had suggested, but to a crowded basement full of the jangle and clatter of cutlery and crockery and the smell and sputter of frying liver. The name of this cave was the Help Yourself Buffet. Its habitats, habitus, mostly clerks like Crowley, pronounced buffet to rhyme it with rough it, which was incorrect but apt. The place was, as its patrons never tired of reminding one another as they tr tried with practiced eye and hand to capture the largest sandwiches, a conscious beanery. As a matter of fact, one's conscience had a string tied to it by a cynical management. The system is simple. There are piles of food everywhere with prominent price tags. The hungry patron seizes and devours what he wishes. He then passes down a runway and reports, to the best of his mathematical and ethical ability, the amount his meal has cost, usually for reasons unknown, 45 cents. The report is made to a small automa automa automaton of a boy with a blasé eye in a brassy voice, he hands the patron a ticket marked 45, then at the same instant screams in a senior, sir, <laughs> sirenic and incredulous voice, 45. Then the patron passes on down the alley and pays the cashier at the exit. The purpose of the boy's violent outcry is to signal the spotter, who roves among the foods, a derby hat co cocked over one eye and an untasted sandwich in his hand, so that person's deficient in conscience may not basely report their total as 45 when actually they've eaten 90 cents worth. On this day, when Crawley, 
Oh, it's Crawly, not Crowley. Um, Crawly Addix had finished his modest lunch. The spotter was lurking near the exit. Several husky-looking young men passed him, and Brazen reported totals of 20 cents, when it was obvious that persons of their brawn would not be content with a lunch costing less than 75, but the spotter, noting their bull necks and bellicose air, let them pass. But when Crawley approached the desk and reported 45, the spotter pounced on him. Experience had taught the spotter the type of man one may pounce on without fear of sharp words or resentful blows. Pardon me a minute, friend, said the spotter. Ain't you made a little mistake? Me? quavered Crawley. He was startled and he looked guilty, as only the innocent can look. Yes, you, said the spotter, scowling at the weak outlines of Crowley's countenance. No, jerked out Crowley. Forty-five's correct. He tried to move along toward the cashier, but the spotter's bull, bulk, blocked the exit alley. Exit alley. Ain't you the guy I've been lay seen laying away a double portion of strawberry shortcake with cream? Asked the spotter sternly. Crawley hopped. Crawley hoped that it was not an apparent that his upper lip was trembling. His hands went up to his polka dot tie and fidgeted with it. He had paused yearningly over the strawberry shortcake, but he decided he couldn't afford it. Didn't have shortcake, he said huskily. Oh, no, rejoined the spotter sarcastically, appealing to the ring of interested faces that had now crowd, crowded about. I suppose that white stuff on your upper lip ain't whipped cream. It's milk, mumbled Crawley. All I had was milk and oatmeal crackers and apple pie. Honest. The spotter snorted dubiously. Some guy, he declared loudly, tucked away a double order of strawberry shortcake and a hamburger stick, and it wasn't me. So come on, young feller. You owe the house 90 cents, so cut out the argument. I, I, began Crawley. Incoherently, rebellious, but it was clear that the crowd believed him guilty of the conscienceless swindle. So he quailed before the spotter's accusing eye and said, Oh, well, have it your own way. You got me wrong, but I guess you have to pick on little fellas to keep your job. He handed over 90 cents to the cashier. You'll never see my face in this dump again, muttered Crowley savagely over his shoulder. That won't make me bust out crying, chinless, called the spotter de derisively. Crawley stumbled up the steps, his eyes moist, his heart pumping fast. Chinless, the old epithet. The old curse, it's blistered his soul. Moodily, he sought out the bench in Madison Square, hunched himself down and considered his case. Today, he felt, was the critical day of his life. It was his 30th birthday, and I'm on my thirstiest birthday. His mind flashed back, as you've seen it done in the movies, to a scene the night before, in which he had had a leading role. Emily, he had said to the loveliest girl in the world, will you marry me? Plainly, Emily Mackey had expected something of the sort, and after the fashion of the modern business girl had given the question calm and clear-visioned consideration. Crawley, she said softly, I like you. You are a true friend. You are kind and honest, and you work hard, but, oh, Crawley, dear, we couldn't live on $22.50 a week, now could we? That was Crawley's present salary after 11 years with the Perian Piano Company. And he'd had to admit that Emily was right. They could not live on it. But dearest Emily, he argued, tomorrow the appoint they appoint a new assistant purchasing agent, and I'm in line for the job. It pays 50 a week. But are you sure you'll get it? His face fell. No, no he admitted. But I deserve it. I know the job about ten times better than any of the others, and I've been there longest. You thought they'd promote you last year, you know, she reminded him. And so they should have, he replied, flushing. If it hadn't been for old Grizzly Cowden, he thinks I couldn't make a good make good because I have one of those underslung jaws like his. He's a brute, cried Emily. You know more about piano business than he does. I think I do, said Crowley. 
but he doesn't, and he's the boss. Oh, Crawley, if you only assert yourself. I guess I never learned how, said Crawley sadly. <laughs> that was kind of fun. <laughs> I like this. If only he had a stronger chin. That was what was holding him back his entire career. As he sat there on the park bench, plagued by the demon of introspection, he had it. He, I like that sounds really sinister. As he sat there on the park bench, plagued by the demon of introspection, he had to admit that he was, was not the pugnacious type, the go-getter sort that Cowden spoke of often and admiringly. admiringly. He knew his job. He could say that of himself in all fairness, for he'd spent many a night studying it. Someday, he told himself, they'd be surprised. The big chiefs and all of them. To find out how much he did know about the piano business. But would they ever find out? Nobody ever reflected Crawley. Ever listened when he talked. There was nothing about him that carried conviction. It had always been like that since he was his very first day in school. When the boys had jeeringly noted his rather remarkable marked resemblance to a haddock and called out chinless chinless stop trying to swallow your face around the chinlessness his character had developed no one had ever taken him seriously so quiet so quite naturally he found it hard to take himself seriously it was inevitable that his character should become as chinless as his face his apprenticeship under the thumb and chin of the domineering cowden had not tended to decrease his youthful timidity Cowden, with a jut of jaw like a paving block, had bullied Crawley. Sorry, had bullied Crawley for more years. More than once, Crawley had yearned burningly to plant his fist square on that black, blue black prong of chin, and he had even practiced up on a secondhand punching bag that was with his end in view. With this end in view, oh my gosh, I'm having a stroke over here. But always he weakened to the crucial instant. He let his resentment escape through the safety valves of intense application to the business of his firm. It comforted him somewhat to think that even the big-jawed president, Mr. Flagstead, is everyone just big jaws in this world? <laughs> like all the successful people? Mr. Flagstead probably didn't have a better grasp of the business as a whole than he. Chinless Crowley Addicts. Assistant to the assistant purchasing agent, but, and he groaned aloud at the thought, uh, his light was hidden under a bushel of chinlessness. Someone had left a crumpled morning edition of an evening paper on the bench, and Crowley glanced idly at it. From out the pages shared, stared the determined, incisive features of a young man, very liberally endowed with jaw. Enviously, Crowley read the caption beneath the picture. The fighting face of Kid McNulty, the Chelsea Bearcat, who boxes Leonard. 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 With a sigh, Crowley tossed the paper away. He glanced up at the Metropolitan Tower clock and decided that he had just time enough for a cooling beaker of soda. He reached the soda fountain just ahead of three other thirsty men. By every right, he should have been served first, but the clerk, a lofty youth with an air of Grand Duke, after one swift appraising glance at the place where Crawley's chin should have been, disregarded the murmured pineapple phosphate, please, and turned to serve the others. Of them, he inquired solicitously, Enough. What's yourn? But when he came to Crawley, he shot him an impatient look and asked sharply, Well, speak up, can't you? The cool drink turned to galling acid as Crowley drank it. His sprint for the office tried to cling to a glimmering hope that Cowden, Despite his waspishness of the morning. Actually, I've not seen that word ever used like that. Oh, word. Uh, waspishness of the morning. Had given him the promotion. He reached his desk a, a minute late. Crowden prowled past and remarked with a cutting gene geniality. Harder to bear than a curse. Well, Mr. Addicts, you dallied too long over your lobster and quail, didn't you? Under his desk, Crowley's fist nodded tightly. He made no reply. To... Morrow, probably. He'd have an office of his own, and he'd be almost free from Crowden's ill-natured raillery. At this thought, he bent almost cheerfully over his stack of work. A girl rustled a eye and thumbtacked a small notice on a bulletin board. Crawley's heart ascended to the point immediately below his Adam's apple and stuck there, for the girl was Cowden's secretary, and Crawley knew what the announcement that notice contained. 
He knew it was against the Spartan code of office etiquette to consult the board during work hours, but he thought of Emily and what the announcement meant to him, and he rose and with quick steps crossed the room and read the notice. Ellis G. Baldwin has this day been promoted to assistant purchasing agent. Signed, Samuel Cowden, CPA. Crawley Addicts had to steady himself against the board. The black letters on the white card jigged before his eyes. His stomach felt cold and empty. Baldwin promoted over his head. Blatant Baldwin, who was never sure of his facts, but always sure of himself. Cocksure, incompetent Baldwin. But, but he had a bulldog jaw. Crawley Addicts, feeling old and broken, turned around slowly to find Cowden standing behind him. A wry smile on his lips. His pinpoint eyes fastened on Crowley's stricken face. Well, Mr. Addicts, purred the chief purchasing agent, are you thinking of going out for a spin in your limousine, or do you intend to favor us with a little work today? He tilted his jaw toward Crowley. I I thought I was going to get that job, began Crowley Addicts, fingering his necktie. Cowden produced a rasping sound by rubbing his chin with his finger. Little... <laughs> Oh, did you indeed? he asked. And what made you think that, Mr. Addicts? I've been here the longest, faltered Crawley. And I want to get married, and I know the job best, and I've been doing the work ever since Sebring quit, Mr. Cowden. For a long time, Cowden did not reply, but stood rubbing his chin and smiling pityingly at Crawley Addicts, until Crowley, his nerves tense, wanted to scream. Then Cowden measured his words, spoke loud. Measuring his words, spoke loud enough for the others in the room to hear. Mr. Addicts, he said. That job needs a man with a punch. And you haven't a punch, Mr. Addicts. Mr. Addicts, that job requires a fighter, and you're not a fighter. Mr. Addicts. Mr. Addicts. That job requires a man with a jaw on him. And you haven't any jaw on you, Mr. Addicts. Get me? He thrust out his own peninsula of, of chin. <laughs> it was then that Crowley Addicts erupted like a long, suppressive volcano. All the hate of eleven bullied years was concentrated in his knotted hand as he swung it swish swishingly from his hip and landed it flush on the outpointing chin. An ox might have withstood that punch, but Cowden was no ox. He rolled over <laughs> damn. He rolled among the waste paper baskets, snorting furiously, he scrambled to his feet and made a bull like rush at Crawley. Trembling in every nerve, Crowley Addicts swung at the blue-black mark again, and Cowden reeled against a desk. As he fell, his thick fingers closed on a cast-iron paperweight that lay on the desk. Crowley Addicts had a blurred, split-second vision of something black shooting straight at his face. Then he felt a sharp, brain-jarring shock, and then utter darkness. When the light came back to him, again, it was in the Bellevue, <laughs> Bellevue Hospital. His face felt quiet. His face felt queer, numb and enormous. He raised his hand feebly to it. It appeared to be covered with concrete bandages. Don't touch it, cautioned the nurse. It's in a cast, and it's setting. It took long weeks for it to set. They were black weeks for Collie, Crowley, brightened only by a visit or two from Emily Mackey. At, the last, at last, the nurse removed the final bandage, and he was discharged from the hospital. Outside the hospital gate, Crawley paused in the sunlight. Not many blocks away, he saw the shimmer of the East River, and he faced toward it, forward it, toward it. He could bury his catastrophe there and forget his smashed-up life, his lost job and his shattered chances of ever marrying. Who would have him now? At best, it meant the long, weary climb up from the very bottom, and he was past 30. He took a half-step in the direction of the river. He stopped. He felt a hand plucking timidly at his coat sleeve. The person who plucked at his sleeve was, limp, was a limp youth with a limp cigarette and a vocifer, vociferous checked his clothes. Wait, what? Sorry. I actually don't... What the, I've never heard that one. Hold on. We're going to look that up real quick. Oh, Vociferous. And Vociferous checked clothes and cap. Oh, and 
by the way, that means uh, vehement or clamorous. Oh, thanks. Just other. There was no mistaking the awe in his tone as he spoke. Say, said the limp youth, ain't you Kid McNulty, de Chelsea Bearcat? He, Crowley Attics, taken for Kid McNulty, the prize fighter? A wave of pleasure swept over the despondent Crowley. Life seemed suddenly worth living. He had been mistaken for a prize fighter. He hardened his voice. That's me. Gee, said the limp youth. I seen you box Leonard. Gee, that was a battle. Say next time you meet him, you'll knock him out for a row of circus tents, won't you? I'll knock him for a row of aquariums, promised Crowley. He jauntily, and he jauntily faced about and strolled away from the river towards Madison Square, followed by the admiring glances of the limp youth. He felt the need of refreshment and pushed into a familiar soda shop. The same lofty Grand Duke was on duty behind the marbled counter and was taking advantage of a lull by imparting a high polish to his fingernails, and subsequently he did not observe the unobtrusive entrance of Crowley Attics. Crowley tapped timidly with his dime on the counter. The Grand Duke looked up. Pineapple phosphate, please, said Crowley still. I'm sorry. Pineapple phosphate, please, said Crowley in a voice still weak from his hospital days. The Grand Duke shot up from his reclining position as if attached to, as if attached to a spring. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right away, he smiled and hustled about his task. Shortly, he placed the beverage, beverage before the surprised Crowley. Is it all right? Want a little more syrup? Inquired the Grand Duke anxiously. Crowley, almost bewildered by this change of demeanor, raised the glass to his lips. As he did so, he saw the reflection of a face in the glistening mirror opposite. He winced and set down the glass, untasted. He stared, fascinated, overwhelmed. It must surely be his face, since his body was attached to it. But how could it be? The eyes were the mild blue eyes of Crowley Attics, but the face... The face was the face of a stranger, and a startling-looking stranger at that. Crowley knew, of course, that it had been necessary to rebuild his face, shattered by the missile hurled by Cowden. But in the hospital, they had kept mirrors from him. And he had discovered, but only by sense of touch, that his countenance had been considerably altered. But he had not dreamed that the transformation would be so radical. In the clear light, he contemplated himself, and understood why he had been mistaken for the Chelsea Bearcat. Kid McNulty had a large amount of jaw, but he never had a jaw like the stranger with Crowley Attic's eyes who stared back, horrified at Crowley from the soda fountain mirror. The plastic surgeons had done their work well. There was scarcely any scar, but they had built from Crowley's crushed bones a chin that protruded like a pro of a battleship. The mariners of mythology, whom the sorceresses had changed into pigs, could hardly have been more perplexed and alarmed than Crowley Attics. He had, in his thirty years, grown accustomed to his meek, all-apologetic face. The face that looked back at him was not meek or apologetic. It was distinctly a hard face. It was a determined, forbidding face. It was almost sinister. Crowley had the uncanny sensation of having had his soul slipped from into the body of another man, an utter stranger. Inside, he was the same timorously, timorous young assistant to the assistant purchasing agent, out of work. Outside, he was a fearsome being, a dangerous-looking man who had an autocrat who made autocratic soda dispenser jump. Who made autocratic soda dispensers jump? To him came a sinking, lost feeling, a cold emptiness, the feeling of a gentle Dr. Jackal who wakes to find himself in the shell of a fierce Mr. Hyde. For a second or two, Crowley Attics regretted that he had not gone on the, to the river. The voice of the soda clerk brought him back to the world. If your drink isn't the way you like it, sir, said the Grand Duke amiably, just say the word and I'll mix you up another. Crowley started up. It's all right, he murmured, and fumbled his way out to Madison Square. He decided to live a while longer, face and all. It was something to be deferred to by soda clerks. He sank down on the bench and considered what he should do. At the twitter of familiar voices, he looked up and saw the blonde stenographer and the brunette stenographer from his former company passing on the way to lunch. 
He rose, advanced a step towards them, tipped his hat, and said, Hello. The blonde stenographer drew herself up regally, as she had seen someone do in the movies, and chilled Crawley with an icy stare. Don't get so fresh, she said coldly. To whom do you think you're speaking to? You got a crust, observed the brunette, outdoing her companion and crushing hotter. Just take yourself and your baby scarer away, Mr. Masher, and get yourself a job posing for animal crackers. They swept on. <laughs> they swept on as I bet that was like a real fucking burner back in 1920. Just, <laughs> just roasting. They swept on as majestical, the as tight skirts and French heels would permit, and Crowley, confused, subsided back to on his bench again. Into his brain, buzzing now from the impact of so many new sensations, came a still stronger impression that he was now not Crawley Attics at all, but an entirely different and fresh-born being, unrecognized by his old associates. He pondered on the trick fate had played on him until hunger beckoned him on to the help-yourself buffet. He was inside before he realized what he was doing, and before he recalled his vow never to enter there again, the same spotter was moving in and out among the patrons. The same derby cocked over one eye, an untasted sandwich, doubtless the same, in his hand. He paid no special heed to the renovated Crowley attics. Crowley was hungry and under the spotter's very nose. He helped himself to a hamburger steak and double order of strawberry shortcake with thick cream. Satisfied, he started towards the blasé check boy with the brassy voice. As he went, his hand felt casually in his change pocket and he stopped short. Gripped by horror, the coins he counted were the amount to exactly 45 cents, and his meal totaled a dollar at least. Furthermore, there was his last cent in the world. That was his last cent in the world. He cast a quick frightened glance around him. The spotter was lounging against the check desk, and his beady eyes seemed to focus on Crawley Attics. Crawley knew that his only chance lay in bl bluffing. He drew in a deep breath, thrust forward his new chin, and said to the boy, Forty-five. Forty-five, screamed the boy. The spotter pricked up his ear. Pardon me a minute, friend, said the spotter. Ain't you made a little mistake? Summoning every ounce of nerve he could, Crowley looked straight back into the spotter's eyes. No, said Crowley loudly. For the briefest part of a second, the spotter wavered between duty and discretion. Then the beady eyes dropped and he murmured, Oh, I beg your pardon. I thought you was the guy that got, that just got outside of raft of strawberry shortcake and hamburger. Guess I made a little mistake myself. With a brisk, firm step of a conqueror, Crowley Attic strode into the air, away from the scene he had once left so humiliated. Again, for many reflective minutes, he preoccupied one of those chairs of philosophy, a park bench, and revolved in his mind the problem, where do I go from here? The vacuum in his pockets warned him that his need of jaw was imperative. Suddenly, he realized his thoughtful clutch on his new jaw, and his eyes brightened and his spine straightened with a startling idea that at once fascinated and frightened him. He would try to get his old jaw back again. Inside him, the old shrinking Crawley fought it out with a new Crawley. Don't be foolish, bleated the old Crawley. You haven't the nerve to face Cowden again. Buck up, argued back the new Crawley. You made that soda clerk hop and that spotter quail. The worst Cowden can do is say no. You haven't a chance in the piano company anyhow, demurred the old Crowley. They know you too well. Your old reputation is against you. The spineless jellyfish class at twenty-two fifteen per is your limit there. Nonsense declared the new Crowley masterfully. Masterf masterfully? It's the one job you know. Ten to one, they need you this minute. You've invested 11 years of training in it. Make that experience count. But, but Cowden may take a wallop at me, protested the old Crowley. Not while you have a face like Kid McNulty, the Chelsea Bearcat. Flashback the new Crowley. The new Crowley won. Ten minutes later, Samuel Cowden swiveled around in his chair to face a young man with a pale, grim face and an oversized jaw. Well, demanded Cowden. Mr. Cowden, said Crawley Addicts, 
holding his tremors in check by a great effort of will. I understand you need a man in the purchasing department. I want the job. Cowden shot him a puzzled look. The chief purchasing agent's countenance wore the expression of one who says, Where have I seen that face before? We do need a man, Cowden admitted, staring hard at Crawley. Though I don't know how you knew it, who are you? I'm Attix, said Crawley, thrusting out his new chin. Cowden stared. He's just like, oh, impressive chin. There's a man worth the job. <laughs> like, Cowden stared, started. His brow wrinkled in perplexity. He stared even more intently at the firm visage. Firm visaged man and then shook his head as if giving up a problem. That's odd, he muttered, reminiscently stroking his chin. There was a young fellow by that name here. Crawley was his first name. You're not related to him, I suppose. Crawley, the unrecognized, straightened up in his chair as if he had sat on a hornet. With difficulty, he gained control over his breathing and managed to growl, No, I'm not related to him. Cowden obviously was relieved. Didn't think you were, he remarked, most amiably. You're not the same type of man at all. Do I get the job? Asked Crawley. In his own ears, his voice sounded hard. What experience have you had? <laughs> this is so sad. Question Cowden briskly. Eleven years, replied Crawley. With what company? With this company, answered Crawley evenly. With this company? Cowden's voice jumped a full octave higher for <laughs> to an incredulous treble. Yes said Crowley. You asked me if I was related to Crowley Attics. I said no. That's true. I'm not related to him because I am Crowley Attics. With a gasp of alarm, Cowden jumped to his feet and prepared to defend himself from an instant onslaught. The devil you are, he cried. <laughs> Sit down, please, said Crowley quietly. Oh, I'm sorry. Sit down, please, said Crowley quietly. Cowden in a daze sank back into his chair and sat staring, hypnotized at the man opposite of him. Opposite him, as one might stare who found a young pink elephant in his bed. I'll forget what happened if you will, said Crawley. Let's talk about the future. Do I get the job? Uh, what's that? Cowden began to realize that he was not dreaming. Do I get the job? Crowley repeated. A measure of his accustomed self-possession had returned the chief purchasing agent, and he answered with as much of his old manner as he could mas muster. I'll give you another chance if you think you can behave yourself. Thanks, said Crowley, and inside his new self sn sniggered at his old self. The chief purchasing agent was master of himself by now, and he rapped out in the voice that Crowley only knew, well, knew only too well. Get right to work. Same desk, same salary. And remember, no more monkey business, Mr. Addicts, because if... He stopped short. There was something in the face of Crawley Addicts that told him to stop. The big new jaw was pointing straight at him, as if it were a pistol. You said just now, said Crawley, and his voice was hoarse, that I wasn't the same type of man as Crawley Addicts who worked here before. I'm not. I'm no longer the sort of man it's safe to ride. Please don't call me Mr. unless you mean it. Cowden's eyes strayed from the snapping eyes of Crowley Attics to the taut jaw. He shrugged his shoulders. Report to Baldwin, was all he said. As Crowley turned away, his back hid from Crowden the smile that had come over his new face, had come to his new face. The reincarnated Crowley had been back at his old job for ten days, or more accurately, ten days and nights, for it had taken that long to straighten out the snarl in which Baldwin... Not quite so sure of himself now, had been immersed to the eyebrows. Baldwin was watching, a species of awe in his eye, while Crowley swiftly and expertly checked off and completed a complicated price list. Crowley looked up. Baldwin, he said, laying down the work. I'm going to make a suggestion to you. It's for your own good. Shoot, said the assistant purchasing agent warily. You're not cut out for this game, said Crowley Attics. What? sputtered Baldwin. Crawley leveled his chin at him. Baldwin listened as the new addicts continued. You're not the buying type, Baldwin. You're the selling type. Take my advice and get transferred to the selling end. You'll be happier and you'll get further. Say, began Baldwin, truesently. You've got a nerve. 
I've got a good notion to... Abruptly, he stopped. Crowley's chin was set at an ominous angle. Better think it over, Crowley Addicts said. <laughs> said Crowley Addicts, taking up the price list again. Baldwin gazed for a full minute or more at the remade jaw of his assistant. Then he conceded, maybe I will. A week later, Baldwin is announced. Sorry, I'm getting all jumbled up here. This is like, this is going to be giddy. Uh, a week later, Baldwin announced that he had taken Crawley's advice. The old addicts would have waited with anxious nerves on edge for the announcement of Baldwin's successor. The new addicts went straight to the chief purchasing agent. Mr. Cowden, said Crawley, as calmly as a bumping heart would permit, shall I take over Baldwin's work? The chief purchasing agent crinkled his brow petulantly. petulantly. I had Heaton in mind for the job, he said shortly without looking up. I want it, said Crawley Addicts, and his jaw snapped. His tone made Cowden look up. Heaton isn't ripe for the work, said Crawley. I am. Cowden could not see that inside Crowley was, cr Crawley was quivering. He could not see the new Crowley was struggling with the old and was exerting every ounce of willpower he possessed to wring out the words. All Cowden could see was the big jaw, bulging and threatening. He cautiously poked back his, into his office chair so that it rolled on its casters out of range of the man with the dangerous face. I told you once before, Addicts, began the chief purchasing agent. You told me once before, interrupted Crowley, Addicts sternly, that the job required a man with a jaw. What do you call this? He tapped his own remodeled prow. Cowden found it impossible not to rest his gaze on the spot indicated by Crowley's forefinger. Unconsciously, perhaps, his beads of eyes roved over his desk in search of a convenient paperweight or other weapon. Finding none, the chief purchasing agent affected, the consider affected to consider the merits of Crowley's demand. Well, he said with a judicial air, I've got a no I've a notion to give you a month's trial at the job. Good, said Crawley, and inside he buzzed and tingled warmly. Cowden wheeled his desk chair back within range again. A month after Crowley Addicts had taken up his duties as assistant purchasing agent, he was sitting late one afternoon in serious conference with the chief purchasing agent. The day was an anxious one for all the employees of the great piano company. It was the day when the directors met in solemn and awful conclave and the ancient acidious oh my gosh and the ancient and acidious chairman of the board c foss what a fucking name c foss langdon who owned most of the stock emerged woodchuck like from his hole to conduct his annual much dreaded inquisition into the corporation's affairs and to demand with many searching queries why in blue thunder the company was not making more goddamn money <laughs> on this day dignified i don't know because you're selling fucking pianos <laughs> like how, how many how many a million on this dignified day dignified and confident executives wriggled and wilted like tardy schoolboys under his grilling and official heads were lopped off with a few sharp words as frightened secretaries slipped in and out of the mahogany doored boardroom, information seeped out and breaths were held. Tiptoes walked on as the reports flashed about from the office, from office to office. Old Langdon's on the rampage. He's raking the sales managers over the coals. He's fired Sherman, the advertising manager. He's fired the whole advertising department, too. He's asking what in the blue thunder is the matter with the purchasing department. When this last ringside bulletin reached Cowden, he scowled, muttered, and reached for his hat. If anybody should come looking for me, he said to Crawley, tell him I went home sick. But, protested Crawley, who knew well the habits of an exi exigent chairman of the board, Mr. Langdon may send down here any minute for an explanation of the purchasing department's report. Cowden smiled sardonically. So he may, so he may. He said, clapping his hat firmly to his head, on his head. Perhaps you'd, do, you'd be so good as to tell him what he wants to know. And still smiling, the chief purchasing agent hurried to the freight, freight elevator and made his timely and prudent exit. Gosh, said the blonde stenographer. Grizzly Cowden's ducked again this year. Gee, said the brunette stenographer. 
Here's where poor Mr. Addicts gets it, where Nelly wore the beads. What is that ancient phrase? Crowley knew what they were saying. He knew that he had been left to be the scapegoat. He looked around for his own hat. But he did but as he did, so he caught the reflection of his new face in the plate glass top of his desk. The image of his big impressive jaw heartened him. He smiled grimly and waited. He did not have to wait long. The door was thrust open and President Flagsteed's head was thrust in. Where's Cowden? he demanded nervously. Teeny worried pearls of dew on the presidential's brow bore evidence that he had not escaped the grill. Home, said Crawley. Sick. Mr. Flagsteed frowned. The furrows of worry in his face deepened. Mr. Langdon is furious at the purchasing department, he said. He wants some things in the report explained, and he won't wait. Confound Cowdwin. Crowley's eyes rested for a moment on the reflection of his chin in the glass on his desk. Then he raised them to the president's. Mr. Cowden left me in charge, he said, hoping that his voice wouldn't break. I'll see if I can answer Mr. Langdon's questions. The president fired a swift look at Crawley. At first, it was dubious. Then, as it appraised Crowley's set face, it grew relieved. Who are you? asked the president. Attics, assistant purchasing agent, said Crawley. Oh, the new man. I've noticed you around, said the president. Meant to in introduce myself. How long have you been here? Eleven years, said Crawley. Eleven years, the president was unbelieving. You couldn't have been. I certainly would have noticed your face. He paused a bit awkwardly. Just then, they reached the mahogany door of the boardroom. Crawley Attics, outwardly a picture of a picture of determination, inwardly quaking, followed the president. Old Cephas Langdon was squatting in his chair, his face red from his efforts, his eyes beneath their tufts of brow, irate. Then he spoke. His words exploded in bunches like packs of fireworks. Well, well, he snapped. Where's Cowden? Why didn't Cowden come? I sent for Cowden, didn't I? I want to see the chief purchasing agent. Where's Cowden anyhow? Who are you? Cowden's sick. I'm Attics, said Crawley. His voice trembled, and his hands went up to play with his necktie. They came in contact with the point of his new chin, and fresh courage came back to him. He plunged his hands into his coat pockets and pushed the chin forward. He felt his eyes under the bushy brows surveying his chin. Cowden sick, eh? inquired C Excuse me. Cephas Long Langdon acidly. Seems to me he's always sick when I want to find out what in Blue Thunder ails his department. He held up a report. I installed a purchasing system in 1913, he said, slapping the report angrily. And look here how it's been foozled. He slammed the report down on the table. What I want to know, young man, he exploded, is why material in the Syracuse factories cost 29 cents more for the past three months than for the same period, la period last year. Why, 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 why? He glared at Crowley Attics as if he held him personally responsible. Crowley did not drop his eyes before the glare. Instead, he stuck his chin out another <laughs> notch. His jaw muscles nodded. His breathing was difficult. The chance he'd been working for, praying for, had come. Your purchasing system is all wrong, Mr. Langdon, he said, in a voice so loud that it made them all jump. For a second, it seemed as Cephas Langdon would uncoil and leap at the presumptuous underling with the big chin, but he didn't. Instead, with a smile in which there was a lot of irony and some interest, he asked, Oh, indeed. Perhaps, young man, you'll be so good as to tell me what's wrong with it. You appear to think you know a thing or two. Crowley told him. Eleven years of work and study were behind what he said, and he emphasized each point with a thrust of his jaw that would have carried the conviction even had his analysis of the system been less logical and concise than it was. Old Cephas Langdon, leaning on the director's table, turned his ear trumpet so that he wouldn't miss a word. Well, well. And what would you suggest instead of the old way? He interjected frequently. Crawley had answered ready every time. Darkness and dinner time had come before Crawley had finished. Flagsteed, said old Cephas Langdon. Cephas Langdon, turning to the president. 
Haven't I always told you that what we need in the purchasing department was a man with a chin on him? Just drop a note to Cowden tomorrow, will you? And tell him he needn't come back. He turned toward Crawley and twisted his leathery old face into what passed as for a smile. Young man, he said, don't let anything happen to that jaw of yours. One of these bright days, it's going to be worth $25,000 a year to you. That night, a young man with a prodigious prodigious jaw sat very near a young woman named Emily Mackey, who, from time to time, looked from his face to the ring finger on her left hand. Oh, Crawley, dear, she said softly. How did you do it? Oh, I don't know, he said. I guess I just tried to live up to my jaw. Okay, so that was a pretty solid story. I liked it. Uh, really felt like a motivator for uh, JoJo's kind of esque, where you just do like the powerful stance of a man. Like I just kept imagining that every time he did the whole like jaw out thing. I don't know. It's like a classic story. Getting your confidence from a physical thing, you know, that get your get your, if, make yourself feel good about yourself, then you can act good, so to speak. Obviously, this has probably changed over time. Although I feel like in recent years, stuff like um, it was like was it muling the thing where you're doing that the fucking sigma face is a, a recurring theme of modern times. And there's definitely people who have forums where they talk about uh, face cantel or tilt or whatever. Overall, fun story. Get, finally standing up for himself and then it resulting in a surgery that allows him to... Uh, was this gender-reforming surgery? Just changes 1912 man's life. <laughs> it's interesting. I can see that having an effect on it if you had like a, you know, a weak fucking jawline. Or not a protruding chin that could affect your confidence. Or in this case, he got everything he wanted with the chin. Which is like, I think it's like a it's like a good lesson and a fucked up lesson at the same time. Because he probably could have just had that confidence without it. But sometimes you need a little extra oomph. Especially if you're just non-stop being bullied continually. And that's where you got to be careful. You don't want to bully people. Because what if they, what if you're like their boss and you're bullying them every day. And then you, you get in that altercation and you hit them in the head with a fucking paperweight. And the next thing you know, they come back a like giga chad. And then they like take your job. That's pretty fucked. I don't want to be a part of that system. So, you know, be nice. $25,000 jaw. Hold on. I'm going to look that up real quick. How much is that worth right now? How much? Uh, what, are, what, are, what, are, what are we looking here? Money conversion. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good jaw. I'd be a pretty nice jaw. Make you a millionaire. Almost. I'd be living pretty. Selling pianos. Pianos always crack me up. Side note on that. The, the, I didn't realize I, this is the first time I ever read this story. Uh, I have read another story by the author. He wrote The Most Dangerous Game, which I think I'll read that pretty soon. Uh, and I'm probably going to do a little extra on that. But uh, I've never read this, but as soon as I saw they were selling pianos, I'm like, modern days time? Selling like actual pianos, like full size pianos. The only times I've ever seen people have those is if there's like a government grant for it or like rich people donating to a college. Pianos are expensive. <laughs> I don't know what the average price is for one, but I know they're like the same price as like a new car most of the time, but they're pretty damn pricey. Like uh, there's a piano store near me, like within a hundred miles and I always crack up because I'm just like, how busy can they possibly be in a, like in a town? That doesn't have a population in like the millions. Like who who out here can afford like putting a grand piano in, <laughs> just like in their living room, let alone transporting it safely and maintaining it over the years. But it's still an interesting. I like pianos. I'm uh, I you know what I've been living my life on a keyboard budget though, so maybe I don't know what it's like. But I could only imagine when you sell pianos, it's like you made your commission for the year just selling like one or two of them. If you sell like a few dozen of them, that's pretty pretty solid. I wonder how long, well, obviously there's been piano co companies for a long time. We could diverge on that too. Uh, it's cr uh, artists and crafted instruments, like the market for them. I, I want to say like two or three years ago, there was a, a violin that was like an artist and crafted one from like, it's like three or 400 year old violin. It's been like passed down and it got stolen. And that thing was like worth like 10 or $20 million or some crazy shit like that. But, eh, you know. The story of the sales clerk, or the assistant of purchases, or whatever. This man's rise, we got to see him, you know, nice, there's a nice layout for a story too in general. We had his bottom, where he's just like, you know, not having a good time. His lady doesn't like him that much. 
because he's not making enough money and his jaw's weak. But then he gets gets that jaw surgery, and he just starts getting everything he wants and hustling and uh, taking advantage of it, which is great. Low-key, I want to go to a soda fountain. But that's pretty much it. Have a good one.